Hi everyone, I'm John Lin, the Founder and Chief Editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in health IT. And today's guest is David Schweppe, he's Chief Analytics Officer at Medi Analytics. Welcome, David. Thank you, John. I guess I could probably talk to myself a little bit. Um, I've been in healthcare for about 30 plus years uh, with a very large provider. I was uh, in charge of a lot of data science, data integration, reporting. Um, I've been with Medi Analytics now as a CAO for nine months, I think. Wow. Um, before that, I was with them as a customer. So I retired from my last job and 10 days later, uh, Medi Analytics came along and said, why don't you join us? So awesome. I know what retirement is like for 10 days. So here I am. <laughs> well, it's quite the retirement. Now we're here at the, you know, you're, you're attending the AHIP conference, right? And, you know, payers are, are a really interesting user set. But what do we know that really works for this AHIP end user? I think what really works is something that's very broad and very deep. Um, we have a lot of challenges in the data space around integration of data. And we all know about our silos. We all know about our little special <laughs> analytical groups that are hidden yep. back in those little corners that we don't tell anybody about. So I think one of the big things at AHIP, and I just had a chance to walk around the exhibit floor this afternoon, there's a lot of solutions around bringing all the data together into one place or a lot of interactivity between uh, vendors. I'm excited about seeing that happen because as I've been a customer and a purchaser for 30 some odd years and worked with hundreds of vendors, I've always seemed to buy the solution uh -huh. and trying to make them work on the back end. And uh, it's good to see that everybody's kind of got that figured out now yeah. a lot better. Well, I think that's interesting. One of the trends I see is around like SDOH or even health equity data. Tell us, you know, what, what are you seeing in that regard and how can we make that data more actionable? Well, as we learn in COVID, health equity is important, you know, and lives matter. And uh, it really is important that we think about people as the person they are, not about their environment, not about their health care, all as separate components. We're made out of our behavioral health, our environment, our social, our DNA, our zip code. Mm -hmm. I think what we're going to be seeing a lot in, uh, around that stuff, especially with, with Medi Analytics, we're really seeing a lot of bringing that data in. It really um, adds more to create a full picture of the person. You think about it, um, without health equity, we don't really have quality care because we're not applying care equally across um, our society. And so I think we're trying to figure out ways to bring that data forward. You know, if you think about SDOH also too being, I like call social drivers of health, not determinants, mm -hmm. because it really is a driver. You know, can I get to the doctor? If I live on the second floor, can I get downstairs? Can I walk to the drugstore? safely? Mm -hmm. Can I get food in my neighborhood? All those things are challenges for a number of people in our society and understanding that allows us to be more flexible in providing care on, on their terms. Yeah, I mean it's great that many analytics is working on that. What do you think is driving the desire for this? Is it is it around value-based care or or what's the motivation to dive into this challenging problem? I mean, value-based care is an interesting idea. Value-based care has always been around you know, am I doing good quality, good affordability? You know, think about triple aim, that third triangle is about the patient experience is the way I think about it, mm -hmm. which is accessing care. Am I satisfied with my care? And I think SDOH and health equity bring that to the forefront. Am I, what is my satisfaction? How am I feeling? You know, I always think about if I have chronic disease and I have multiple chronic diseases, one of them is a behavioral health issue like depression, which is 40% mm -hmm. of diabetics in an article I just read have depression. Wow. Well, until I get that resolved, my, my diabetes is a second class chronic disease. Yeah. So I need to bring that together and think about that. And if I have depression and I need to have medications to take that on, then my environment becomes important if I can't get to my drugs. Mm -hmm. you know. And so the, all those components were together. So, so I think the piece that's been missing along the whole time has been that who am I as a person? You always say 10% of my health care is done by my provider. You know, the other 80% is my family, my friends, my environment. Well, that didn't add up to 100%, but 10% <laughs> is missing there somewhere. But you're thinking about um, how that all blends together really is the, kind of what that centerized care around that person is. And if you don't have the data to understand that, you are actually doing 
Well, you could have do bad things for the, for yeah. the patient. Well, have bad could, outcome. It could have bad outcomes. I, we've seen that. I think, you yeah. know, when you don't have the data to be able to treat the patient effectively, you don't. And, exactly. and, and then bad outcomes occur. You know, I, I, I hear you talking about it, though, and you brought up two major problems, right? I mean, SDOH and health equity, we talked about that. And then you also brought in the mental health component. If I'm a payer organization and I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay. I, I need to do all that, I need, you know, and 13 other things <laughs> that I need to do, right? We, but we all have limited resources. So what do you think is the key to really making most of, of those limited resources, whether it's time or money? I think having a complete set of data. Mm. Uh, and that sounds simple to say. We know it's really hard to build yeah, and true. integrate. And, you know, we've got layers. We've got regulatory and government types of data sets. We've got public data sets. We've got our own private data sets. We have contention between payer and provider, sharing of data. I mean, the first thing you always hear from a provider when a payer is talking to them about data is, well, my group's more risky. Mm -hmm. So creating an even playing field with definitions and mapping is really important. And then if it's all based on the same set of rules, we can all play in the same game together and see the data together and find those actual insights together. But I think we're we're still going to be challenged with that. Um, mm -hmm. We're still not a complete system. We're still fragmented, you know. Even with things like fire, you know, and mm -hmm. HL seven and SNOMED and all the things we've done over the years, there's still missing components. Yeah. You know, you think about um, you know as a payer also too, your customers are your employer organizations, your group purchasers, your brokers, your consultants. What do they want to know? Mm -hmm. Well, they want to compare benefits across plans. Are plans sharing that? In, yeah. in a centralized repository. Um, how are they planning for that? Are they self-funded? Are they um, fully insured? Well, theoretically, the care is the same, but the funding mechanism is different. So bringing that data together so you can only look at the outcomes of that data. So am I getting high quality? Is my preventative care being done? Is it affordable? Mm. Are there hidden costs? So all that kind of comes into play, I think, when you want to think about bringing it all together. I'm a big I've always started the data integration in place. I got once you got mm -hmm. good data, everything from there is not simpler, just easier. Yeah. I mean, to your point, I was talking to a CIO recently who was doing an AI project, and he said the reason we were able to do it effectively is because we'd already aggregated the data, which I think was exactly what you were yeah. saying. Like once the data is together, these other projects are easier and are possible. Um, well, you know, I brought up AI and machine learning and this one, which was, I was interested. How is MIDI Analytics approaching this, right? I mean, it, it seems like everyone's saying it. What is MIDI Analytics really doing? You know, MIDI Analytics has a really deep set of, of uh, AI, which I like to call augmented intelligence. Okay. It's not artificial. It's augmented. Mm -hmm. It helps humankind. Um, and machine learning. We do a lot of that on the data prep side. You know, when you're loading our data, whether it's real time or monthly or whatever it is, it's walking through a process with ETL. It's, it's discovering things. It's learning things about the customer. It's presenting that in the in the analytical application, and then the analytical application. We've also got a lot of forecasting, trending, um, uh, narratives, uh, grouping type clustering algorithms. Mm -hmm. Things that really people don't see. And I think what's really nice about our tool, a lot of the users of analytics are not analyst people. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I call myself a data scientist. I was an informaticist 10 years ago, and before that I was a coder. So you know, whatever we call ourselves these days. But that concept is hard. You know, everybody can use Excel. Yeah. Well, we know Excel is hard. If you've got 1,000 Excel spreadsheets, you have 1,000 <laughs> answers. Yep. So trying to get that AI ML involved to take the complex and simplify it down and serve up good, well thought out, actionable insights delivered in a way people can actually read them and understand them. Visualizations, charts, because people do both things, you have to have both ways. But I think that end user I'm talking about is a very sophisticated business user, very mm -hmm. sophisticated operations leader, very sophisticated uh, C-suite leader. They're not analysts. They hire people to do that. <laughs> and those resources are expensive. So if you can take those resources and we put them in a place where they're doing that deep dive stuff and create applications like Medi 
which then can serve up this stuff to the people who know the business, right. but don't need to know the analytics. Mm. So I think we get lost a lot in the conversation about we do AI, we do ML. And when you start talking about it, everybody's kind of in the same place. But it's how you deliver that and make it easy for people to use and understand and actually don't even know it's being given to them. Mm. Um, I think that's really kind of the, the secret sauce. Yeah, you know? interesting. Well, and, and to that point, there are a lot of people talking about data. I, I mean, every part of healthcare is like, oh, let's leverage the data. In fact, in our lives too, right? So what do you think makes Medi Analytics unique versus maybe some of the other people out there? Well, Medi Analytics is broad. Um, provider to payer, we cover um, the business cycle, the claims adjudication, um, everything from the patient uh, at the front end all the way through to claim submittal, denial, mm -hmm. prediction, all that stuff on the provider side. We're very, and then on the payer side, kind of think it was a reflection. Mm. They get the claim, they pay it. Um, there's Pop Health. We have employer reporting, which is working off that same claim information. We have uh, a lot of value based medical type analytics underneath, along with workflow analytics. So you actually know how are certain areas working, how they're working together. Hmm. You know, are are the ACOs we're contracting with? Are they are there opportunities? Are there gaps in care? Are there costs that are too high? Who's performing? What's best practice look like? Bringing all that together in a very wide, broad system. I I learned a new term recently, um, pay vider. Uh, I, it's yep. a funny term, but really <laughs> that's what we're trying to accomplish at Medi is to create a, uh, a world where the provider, the payer, and even the employer organization, the purchaser are all on the same page. Mm -hmm. We're playing on the same field. You know, we're, we're hitting the same ball. We know we're sharing the same rules. And so I kind of think it is Teflon. You know, make the frictionless piece about the data. Uh, so May is very broad and very deep. Um, and when you're looking and shopping for healthcare information systems, you want some, in my mind, that, like I said at the beginning of our conversation, we want to de-silo that. Yeah. So if I can put it all in one place and have different modules plug and play, that makes my life easier. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking I've got them already, my, my adoptions with something, and I can bring it together and, yeah. and have a better outcome with my information. It becomes actionable. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So what advice would you have for those that you know look at it and say, you know, how can I get more value out of this data? It's one thing to aggregate it and get rid of the silos, but how can I get value out of it? You know, a lot of data is reporting. Mm -hmm. And reporting is how many of something happened, how many of uh, dollars did I spend on that thing? Um, they're very descriptive, right? And everybody's good at descriptive metrics. That's reporting. Um, next level is diagnostic kind of information. What's driving that? So, you know, if I'm in the world of a payer, employer, organization, provider, one of my highest things I'm going to be rated on is inpatient maternity. Mm. It's always in the top 10. Okay, what do I do with that? Well, let's look at inpatient maternity. What's driving that? Is there high cost claimants? Is there NICU uh, issues going on? Is preventative health around uh, high-risk pregnancy not being accomplished? Hmm. Understand that. Um, the next step down is predictive modeling, right? Really thinking about, now that I know the what and what's driving it, can I kind of predict a few cycles in the future about how it might go? Can I trend it forward? Can hmm. I think about that? That's really, I think, where the magic is right now. Because people coming out of COVID are having financial challenges, hospitals, providers, payers, um, everybody's looking for the dollar. And so how do you create those instruments where I can find those savings, those efficiencies, those best practices? So what you want to do is really take all that together with some good augmented intelligence and show people, you know, if this is the gap, that gap is costing you X dollars. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you're giving them the answer. I'm still looking for prescriptive analytics that really work. Yeah. You know, <laughs> peer review articles being brought sure. in, Absolutely. experts in the field having a, you know, the best thing would be have the bat phone right there and pick it up when I got the answer and somebody's got the, the way to do it. But we yeah. don't have that yet. So being able to really coalesce it down to a few actionable things. Yeah. You know, report and back to what a reporting is. 
reporting is just Excel spreadsheets and charts and lots of graphs, and I have to understand what they're saying. Yeah. You want the software and the analytics software to tell you what you want to know or what you should look at. So it's serving up that thing, you know, color bars, yep. charts, trend graphs, things that pictorially tell me that's the thing I got to do something with. Yeah. That's your big bang. Yeah, make it easy for them. That's, yeah. how, that's, the, that's, the, that's the message with it all. Well, thanks so much, David. I appreciate you taking time to share your insights and perspectives on this. And thanks everyone for watching. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com or search for Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcasting application. Thanks, David.